The Civil War was a crucial turning point in American history for a wide range of reasons. Since the fall of the Federalist Party, the country had seen increasing domination by its southern and agricultural elements, elements which promoted expansionism, free trade, and decentralization of government. For decades, this would continue until the Civil War shifted power back to the North and to industry for several decades, permanently redefining the character of the country. The South would persist as a distinct American identity, however. The penalties and ostracism it faced in the aftermath of the war driving it to create a persistent political bloc known as the Solid South, which voted against Republican and Northern interests consistently for several election cycles. In short, the Civil War left a lasting scar on North-South relations and dramatically reoriented the direction of the United States toward one wholly defined by the Industrial North. The long-term implications of this were tremendous. On the upside, the industrialism, centralization, and protectionism of the Republican era transformed the many states of the United States into a single, closely connected, wealthy, and powerful entity, capable of building a strong navy to rival even that of Britain, and surpass every other country on the planet in levels of production. One could travel from coast to coast by rail in a matter of days, Crops and livestock raised in Texas could be sold in Illinois or New York as though they were locally produced, the cost of domestic products fell dramatically, making the overall cost of living cheaper, the list goes on. However, this all came at a significant cost. The post-Civil War era saw the United States undergo its most severe wave of corruption yet, both in politics and in business, so much so that it demanded the rise of several administrations whose agendas primarily focused on eradicating said corruption. The haste and recklessness with which emancipation and civil rights were handled by Congress following Lincoln's death created an exacerbated crisis of race relations in the South, as well as terrible economic hardship for Southern whites and blacks alike, the ramifications of which would leave Southerners deeply embittered toward the North for several decades, while relations between American blacks and whites remain tense to this day. Further, it was with this rapid industrialization and accumulation of both power and wealth that the United States began involving itself outside of its immediate domain and saw itself transform into an interventionist power, despite lacking major stakes in the foreign affairs of Asia and Europe. Once again, the list goes on. But what if all that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, the Civil War simply never happened? Just as the results of the war were major and widespread, as were its causes, the Civil War did not just occur as a result of some few years-long tensions, but truly holds root in the fact that from their inception, the colonies of the North and South, which would one day unite to form the United States, were in fact two very different entities. I cover the matter in greater depth in this video here, but the short version is that the Northern states were built up as mercantile-focused economies, were dominated by major coastal urban centers, and carried with them a distinctly Anglo-Puritan culture. The South, in contrast, was built on agriculture, saw power spread out across several inland towns or cities, and largely held up Scotch-Irish Baptist traditions. The contrasting politics that emerged from these two distinct entities is clear to see as well. Northern and coastal regions favored urbanism and centralization. Southern and inland regions favored agrarianism and decentralization. Both parties went into union with distinct views in mind for how this union was to be organized. Northern states where communities were dense and interconnected saw the furthering of this lifestyle as key to building a strong nation, but of course this fell away after the election of 1800. Southern life depended on agriculture and as such adopted policy which complemented agrarianism against northern interests and tastes. This included free trade to ensure ease of access to foreign manufactured goods and reciprocal low tariffs on the South's agricultural exports. This included ideals of state sovereignty and decentralization to keep power in the hands of local farmers and agricultural communities, rather than in a central city. And of course, this included the use of slavery as an inexpensive source of mass labor. Free trade was crippling to northern industry. Decentralization halted development at the national level. And the practice of slavery, never taken up in the north on the same scale it had been in the south, came to be abhorred as the most sinful of practices. Truly, slavery was seen by most Americans, northern and southern alike, as immoral. However, a number of issues stood in the way of the practice's termination. The most common and moderate view of the day was simply that the state had no authority to seize private property from citizens, property including slaves. Further was the question of what would become of the slaves once freed. Most Americans weren't particularly keen on the idea of equal rights at the time, and the few who were may have also hesitated at the idea given the understanding that most slaves were only given a very basic education and thus would struggle to join even a welcoming community. Sending freed slaves to Africa, an idea popular among many of the founders, proved too expensive and exhausting a venture to take up willingly, and so this option was often dismissed even after the establishment of Liberia. Without a plan for the emancipated slaves and a lack of authority to enforce emancipation, the practice continued despite a general sense that it was immoral. A less sympathetic view saw slavery as a tool for maintaining an upper hand against the North in the national balance of power. 
The urban and industrial north had a rapidly rising population and was seemingly prompt to establish several new states that would tilt power back in their favor. The south thus sought to promote pro-agrarian ideals by campaigning for the expansion of slavery into several new states. If agriculture was made easier through the use of slave labor, agriculture would dominate. Further, much like modern red state and blue state divides, a slave state would naturally discourage free staters from migrating there and changing its character, just as a modern state's blue politics might discourage red staters from moving there or even motivate them to move away. At the far end of the spectrum was an ideal held almost exclusively within the Deep South that slavery was ultimately a moral good and that it provided a productive service for whites while instilling in blacks an understanding of hierarchy, the value of labor, and of course the Christian faith. This particular view was an early manifestation of the white man's burden ideal and saw the need for whites to assume a paternalistic role over blacks given the perceived developmental disparity between the two races. The policy of slavery, its restriction or expansion, would become the prime medium through which the North-South power struggle was manifested. The North was diverging in a direction of rapid growth, industrialization, and neo-Puritan progressivism, all the while the South was holding firm to traditional ways established by Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, and other Southerners before them. The brief and narrow common ground the North and South once held during the War for Independence had now been torn asunder by a massive chasm whose creation was propelled by the changes occurring in the long sidelined North and the fear felt in the South that their era of dominance was coming to an end. That fear, as well as divisions within the Democrat Party, would ultimately split the Democrat vote and hand presidential victory in 1860 to the newly formed pro-Northern Republican Party. The rest, as they say, is history, but this time, things are different. Resolving the tension between the North and South becomes increasingly difficult the further down the timeline we move from the country's founding, but that's not necessarily the goal here. Rather, the scenario is focused on preventing the outbreak of a civil war in the United States, and achieving that is not terribly difficult. An honoring of the Missouri Compromise by splitting California into a pair of northern and southern states along the 36th parallel instead of hastily granting this massive territory unitary statehood for the sake of denying the South another slave state probably would have done wonders for cooling rising southern disdain for the North. Annexing Cuba or additional territory for Mexico for the South to establish more states in balance with the North would have cooled southern concerns of being disenfranchised by the North in both houses of Congress by allowing them to maintain an equal senatorial presence. The federal government actually enforcing the Constitution and the Fugitive Slave Act to prevent northern abolitionists from unconstitutionally stealing slaves away from the South would have kept southern faith in the government strong and would have likely dissuaded a majority from pursuing something as radical as secession. Democrats compromising with the North on protectionist policies would have prevented many northerners from feeling that the Democrat Party only served the interests of the South and thus could have taken much momentum away from the Republican Party. The South accepting the limitations of slavery to the states in which it currently existed and pursuing alternative means of promoting agrarianism would have also done wonders to cool tensions between both sides. All of these require us to backtrack in the timeline, however, and there is an option much closer to the outbreak of the Civil War and one which perhaps was much easier to achieve. The South simply doesn't secede. Secession was a radical and perhaps knee-jerk reaction to Lincoln's election, and in a number of southern states, the motion almost failed to pass. Certainly this reaction was a result of a long string of frustrations and fears toward the North, but Lincoln's election was really the breaking point. That's not the case this time around. Southerners and Democrats reflect on the election and realize what the numbers mean. Lincoln had won with less than 40% of the total popular vote because the Democrat vote had split two ways and was challenged by an additional third party, though that being said he still took an electoral majority by carrying every northern state. While this is a sign of rising Northern and Republican influence since the last election, it doesn't at all represent the absolute downfall of Democratic dominance. Barring third parties, the Democrats could have taken 60% of the popular vote in this election had they maintained unity, not to mention the electoral votes of the far western states and New Jersey. That wouldn't have been enough to overcome Lincoln's electoral majority, but outside of New England, just about every other northern state could have been swung in Democrat favor had it not been for the follies of the Buchanan administration, the present divides within the party, and the lack of a major platform to campaign on. Simply put, 1860 had been a bad year for Democrats, but it wasn't the end. Even if the Republicans continued to grow as a party, without the outbreak of the Civil War and the post-war suppression of the South, the Republicans may prove to be only as competitive electorally as the Whigs. Rather than press for secession, a convention is held between leaders of the Democrat Party, North and South alike, and designs are made for how to recover from this loss by the time of the next election, and precisely under what platform to reunite under. Regionalism had brought their internal fragmentation, and regionalism was the platform of the opposition. If they were to rebound as a party, the Democrats would need to reinforce their national appeal, most especially their appeal in the Midwestern states, whose populations were growing and who were believed to be the emerging powerhouse of the country. Surely the new Republican administration would work to contain slavery by preventing its spread to new states, and inevitably new northern states would join the Union. 
As important as the Southern Bloc was to the Democrats, its influence was fading and it could not be the sole regional bloc they appealed to, and with only a meager 18% showing for the Southern Democrats in the election of 1860, National Democrats would be in the majority, though that being said, that majority was concentrated in the contested North, while the South was loyally Democrat. Clearly the party needed cooperation between its northern and southern halves if it hoped to survive. The southern democrats could not steal votes away from the north, while the northern democrats could not defeat the republicans without a reliable support base. A new strategy was necessary to lock the republicans into the northeast, and from the midwest, draw in the loyalty of emerging western states to maintain democratic dominance. The issue of slavery would need to be dropped as a major motivator in politics, as its inevitable containment virtually assured its eventual end. This was a battle the South had lost, but it need not be the hill they die on. The sentiments of the country described earlier in the video would prevent legitimate efforts at immediate abolition once slavery was locked into the states it currently existed in, creating opportunity for a new policy to debate, the status of freed slaves in the United States. The Democrats could take a position of reviving efforts at colonization as a means of appealing to moderates of the day who felt slavery should end, but opposed equal rights being granted onto the freemen. Knowing that the Republicans had built up a platform of egalitarianism and its radical elements have already voiced support for equal rights, this would be an easy way of drawing moderates away from the Republican Party now that the issue of slavery's expansion was dead in the water. Save for a few radical elements in the Deep South, this policy of colonization and resettlement is likely to have universal appeal across the Democrat Party. Sensing that Western states, because of their disconnect to the East, would inevitably come to resist Northeastern centralization, Democrats would double down on a platform of decentralization and states' rights, save for on matters of national infrastructure. Northern Democrats saw firsthand the benefits of road and rail networks, and the tremendous benefits such things could have for agricultural economies, allowing for Northern manufactured goods to be speedily and cheaply delivered to the South and vice versa, providing agricultural communities a large market to sell their crop and livestock to without fear of spoilage. Infrastructure would be of tremendous interest to the developing western states as well, as isolation from the rest of the country would leave them largely on their own in times of need. Once again, this is something certain to draw support away from the pro-infrastructure Republicans, yet see general acceptance by most Democrats. Additionally, having won a combined plurality of votes in 1860 but losing electorally, the Democrats might revive Andrew Jackson's previous effort of abolishing the Electoral College and establishing a more definitively democratic system, though favorability for this would likely vary across the party. Finally, agrarianism would remain a key pillar of democratic policy, but be tempered so as to not entirely alienate urban voters and adapt to meet the needs and desires of northwestern frontiersmen and southwestern ranchers. The north and southeast were clearly set in their ways, but the far west was yet to be defined, while the midwest remained a battleground of rural and frontier lands on one side and lakeside cities on the other. A constant thorn in the side of these cities was agrarian insistence on free trade to reap the full benefits of European trade, despite the fact that this came at the expense of domestic industry. With rail lines providing agricultural communities larger domestic markets for products that would otherwise not be able to be transported long distances, Democrats can afford to compromise on protectionist policy and allow for the raising of tariffs, making their party less unpalatable to industrial voters. In that same vein, efforts would be taken to promote rural living in the West and ensure settlers in those states and territories have the resources and security they need to thrive likely manifesting in the creation of new forts and outposts in areas threatened by Amur Indian attacks, and further ensuring that infrastructure lines branch out into these underdeveloped areas, making commuting to an urban area more convenient and needing to reside within a city for economic opportunities less necessary. If the Democratic Party could transform itself in this fashion before the following election, it absolutely could remain competitive with the Republican Party, and perhaps even reassert its dominance for decades more to come. The Democrats could take control as early as the following election depending on how Lincoln's administration progresses. Lincoln never truly had the opportunity to be a peacetime president because of the Civil War, and even despite this unifying cause, he still found himself at odds with aspects of the Republican Party. Lincoln was a dedicated Whig prior to their dissolution as a party, and a close follower of Henry Clay. When he joined the Republicans, he did so as a moderate, not fully aligning himself with the party's more radical but dominant elements. In fact, he was specifically chosen to be put on the presidential ballot by the party because his views were more widely appealing than the previous Republican frontrunner John C. Fremont and because he was a relative unknown at that point, he had yet to step on any toes within his party. The Lincoln administration would be able to achieve its agenda with little resistance as both the House and Senate would see domination by Republican majorities. This agenda consisted largely of protectionist tariffs and infrastructure projects in line with Lincoln's Whig roots. The beginning of work on a transcontinental railroad would be the most ambitious of these projects and start roughly around the same time it had in our world, though perhaps see its completion arrive sooner without the demands of the Civil War in the background. Without the Civil War to distract the federal government, attention and military forces would be diverted to the Utah Territory, where only some years prior a brief expedition needed to be launched against the Mormons who dominated the region. 
The reason for this potential redirection of military force is that during the Civil War, the Republicans issued a mandate to further enforce monogamy upon the Mormons. However, Lincoln refused to enforce this mandate out of fear that the Mormons would align themselves with the Confederacy in retaliation. With no ongoing civil war, the mandate is enforced, potentially sparking small-scale conflict between armed Mormon groups and the federal military. If not immediately, this would surely spark conflict upon the passing of the Edmunds-Tucker Act, as the act disincorporated the church itself, seized its assets, and imposed new restrictions upon Utah, something the more zealous president of the church at the time, Brigham Young, wouldn't have taken lightly. On the matter of wars, if France still ventured to intervene in Mexico in 1861 despite the U.S. not being preoccupied by the Civil War, Lincoln would almost certainly intervene in defense of Mexico, expelling the French faster. The Homestead Act would still be passed, encouraging a further migration of settlers westward, meeting some resistance from Southern Democrats, but acceptance from Northern Democrats who felt this would only help build a pro-agrarian voter base for them to draw upon in later years. Finally, of course, would come Lincoln's restriction of slavery to the states in which it currently existed. Lincoln would find some resistance from those within his own party, suggesting that this did not go far enough, as well as resistance from Southern Democrats, but ultimately the act would pass, and the potential for the expansion of slavery would be eradicated. Come the election of 1864, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, California, Oregon, and New Jersey could have easily flipped Democrat given their historic voting trends and the outcome of the 1864 election in our timeline, though in all fairness this election isn't the best indicator given that it reflected less the favorability of each party's policies, but rather was a referendum on whether to continue the war or negotiate peace. Still, this does reflect a level of dedication to the Republican cause as well as sympathy for the Democrats, thus why we consider it regardless. With the Democrats now conveying a message that appealed to industry and agriculture alike, which promised continued infrastructure development, which announced excess federal power, and offered a clear plan for post-slavery America, the Republican platform would be reduced to a firmer position on protectionism and promises of increased egalitarianism. The odds of a Democrat victory are strong and would really depend upon public reception of the actions of Lincoln and the Republican Party, as well as whether or not any scandals or incidents were to occur during this administration. Let's also not rule out that Lincoln could run a flawless administration, boosting the popularity of himself and the party, securing a second term. Whatever the case, the Democrats would remain a competitive force moving forward. What this means is that the post-war decades of near uninterrupted Republican rule won't occur this time around, and without a stagnant political establishment, corruption is unable to take root to the same degree it had in our timeline. Democrats would, for their own interests, hold Republicans in check, and vice versa. Industrialization, though slowed slightly by the differing visions of the two parties, does continue at largely the same pace given democratic adoption of policies of infrastructure development and limited protectionism. Resettlement efforts of freed slaves would lead to continued investment in Liberia or a more local colony to be acquired via purchase or conquest such as Cuba or Hispaniola. Resettlement within a state or territory is also a possibility. Given more egalitarian Republican views, resettlement may not be universal either, with well-educated freemen being given the option of equal citizenship within the US or a higher status role in the new colony. The continued influence of a pro-rural, pro-decentralization party holds back Republican efforts of overseas expansion and naval buildup, things which primarily occur in states dominated by coastal urban centers in pursuit of better trade routes or offshore resources. Continued influence of the Democrats would likely see the American land army maintained and developed at an equal pace with the Navy, never being neglected quite as it had in our timeline, and providing the United States an imposing force with which to secure its borders and further exert its influence over its neighbors. While overseas expansion and intervention may be limited, overland expansion becomes far more of a possibility. The US may still purchase Alaska from Russia, perhaps all the more likely now without the debt burden it faced following the war, and invade Canada during the Klondike Gold Rush or some other event, taking advantage of its superior transit lines and larger land army. The America of this timeline is still a powerhouse, but a more localized and condensed powerhouse. Precisely where it would stand politically by 1910 is difficult to say, whether or not we see the rise of Roosevelt and the progressives is also in question. But with a powerful land army and a more local focus, the US could easily move to directly intervene in the Mexican Revolution, turning the border war into a second Mexican-American war. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z.